Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Feedback, episode 23. Um, we've really been looking forward to this one. Uh, it's real special, uh, so thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be talking with David Grubbs, um, professor at CUNY, uh, amazing musician, um, and he has a new book out called The Voice in the Headphones, out on Duke University Press. Um, he's going to be leading a conversation with us and the composer and percussionist Sarah Hennies, who has recently put out a spate of amazing records, including Spectral Malsconsities, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, and The Reinvention of Romance. Um, today, we're going to be talking with them about a piece that Sarah wrote for Yarn Wire in 2019 called Primers. Um, don't forget, you can always send questions ahead of time to us uh, at feedback at yarnwire.org or join the live chat on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch, where we have a grand total of zero watchers usually. <laughs> but please uh, increase that amount if you can, um, and you can submit questions in real time. Uh, we're so glad that you both can be uh, here with us today to talk about this piece on this rainy and dreary Thursday. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, David. Great. Thanks so much, Russell, and, uh, and Laura, and Ning, uh, and Sarah. Um, I, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be at the performance uh, of this work in May 2019 at the Zurcher Gallery in Manhattan. So um, the documentation, the video documentation that you all have posted is fantastic, um, but uh, it, was, it was great to, to revisit that, that live event, and I think that we'll be talking about, about that some. Um, we will we'll look at three excerpts from the piece. Um, we'll look at excerpts from the score um, relative to those those three moments within the piece. But I just wanted to ask a preliminary question, I guess, for all of the participants today. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start with um, Yaron Wire. So when did you all first become aware of Sarah's work and what uh, what about it attracted you to it? Maybe, maybe I should answer this one. Um, <laughs> so I got familiar with Sarah's work a long time ago um, when I was touring with a band um, called High Red Center. And in that band is another percussionist, Mike McCurdy, um, who plays with Mantra Percussion here in the city. Oh. And um, he knew Sarah from both bands and you know our university percussion world um and you know i was looking back at um some shows that i had played and there was a, a show in austin where we all met up i think it was in 2006 you know one of those off-site south by southwest house shows um and so actually my familiarity with sarah's work um really comes from that world and from that time, you know, I think we had stayed in touch and just seen what each other were working on. And uh, then maybe a couple of years ago at Outpost Artist Resources um, here in Ridgewood, um, it might have been at one of Che Chen's uh, Fire Over Heaven shows. Uh, Sarah played, was it Fleas, I think? It, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse uh, me, yeah. Played Fleas, and um, I had known she'd been working on you know, let's call it composition, you know, for lack of a better term. I, you know, I don't think of these things as like separate. Um, you know, we all have these kind of continuing practices. Um, but, you know, this was a different kind of practice that I had seen her do. And I was really taken by that piece. It was, there's a social element to it. Um, it was kind of scary because I didn't know if the bells were going to break. Um, so as a percussionist, I was worried about the gear. And so, um, you know, I, I was like, this is awesome. And having played on shows with Sarah before, um, and knowing that both of us were kind of inhabiting this new music scene as well, it seemed like a great chance to, uh, I've been familiar with, uh, with her work for quite some time. And Sarah, how, how familiar were you with your own wire and how did that familiarity work its way into the uh, conceptualizing of this piece? Uh, pretty familiar for more or less the same reason that Russell said that so like Russell and Mike have been on my radar for ages and I think I must have heard of Yarn Wire like right at the beginning just for that reason that like there that this group was had existed so 
I've been following Yarn Wire, you know, somewhat casually for a long time, but, you know, have a couple albums and always tend to notice what they're up to. And I really like the two piano, two percussion setup. And so I was really psyched to play, to write for them for all of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's jump in with the first clip. So um, all of the clips that I've selected are approximately two minutes. Um, and the, the first one that we're going to see um, spans from approximately five minutes into the piece uh, till about seven minutes and 15 seconds into the piece. So in discussing this piece, uh, I just, I'm aware that we're both talking about this particular piece, uh, but also for some of the viewers that we might potentially be introducing uh, Sarah's work uh, more broadly to them. So I, I just wanted to, to say that in this discussion, wherever it seems helpful, I mean, we can dig into the piece, but wherever it seems helpful to step back and to speak about commonalities between this piece and other pieces, I, I would be most yeah. interested as a listener, right, in 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 make in making those um, movements, right, um, about about the mode of of opening this piece and and of uh, other pieces, right, or of your work more generally. Mm -hmm. So sometimes one conceives of an opening as a gambit or a statement or a first step in a logical sequence, um, or so, you know, sometimes it's just a starting point without, um, you know, without much structural to say that, and is primers um, representative of a broader tendency for how you like to start pieces? It actually is in really different because often I don't write anything without some kind of like conceptual motivation first. And for whatever reason, I just had this it, like it's not that often that music like pops into my head that usually my ideas are extra musical and then I write the piece based on that. But for whatever reason, I had this idea popped in my head of of having these two pianos kind of bouncing notes back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the way that this piece started is that I just wanted to see that happen. Um, and then I, I, you know, as I was writing the, the material just kind of dictated itself, but um I like, I, you know, I went and sat at a piano and I've always really liked that, the the murkiness of the really low register of the piano too. Um, 
so honestly, I just did it and then decided that I would, you know, figure out after the fact uh, what it meant, if, if, if anything. And there's another piece uh, on the album that Russell mentioned that I wrote for the group Beethoven called Spectral Mousconsities that was written the same way that both of them were written around the same time really fast because I was just blisteringly busy. And so I wrote them really, really intuitively, um, not really knowing exactly what I was doing, but having a good idea at least of like what I wanted it to sound like. But um, I don't know. It just, it's the simple answer is that I had, the, <clears throat> I had the idea of this, this kind of like piano tennis match or something that, that I just, you know, I just wanted to hear as a real thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember sitting in the audience and, and thinking, it's funny, te- the tennis match is the reference that, that comes to you, because I found myself thinking about tape delay, right, uh-huh. or some, some kind of electronic processing, in that the pianos are just a few feet apart from one another, and it almost feels like a stereo delay. Right. So I'm looking at the score, for the first six minutes of it, the pianos are just trading the, you know, the same pitch, right, in this offset mm-hmm. um, sequence. Um, it it spreads from two notes to four notes, and you know in the in each of the piano parts. Um, but initially, I was I found myself thinking about um, you as the composer for acoustic instruments uh, in a day and age where obviously you have great familiarity with electronic music, right? So I, I was thinking about certain. Um, techniques and effects that again seem seem uh, to suggest electronic music, um, right? So whether whether it's a stereo delay or uh, the fact of the vibraphones being tuned two cents apart, and w- we were talking about this a little bit before the show, but it would probably be really helpful for you to describe that rather than for me yeah, to yeah. summarize. But in the in the score, it calls for the two vibraphones one to be tuned at, at 440 and one to be tuned two cents. That there were two kinds of vibraphones, 440 and 442. Mm-hmm. It just was one of those ideas that sits in the back of your head for several years where I was like, wouldn't it be great to have a piece for 440 and 442 vibraphone? And then when I was thinking about what I was going to do for Yarn Wire, I, I remember I was driving somewhere and all of a sudden it just, you know, I was thinking about like, well, what am I going to do with for yarn wire? And all of a sudden this popped into my head and I was like, aha. <laughs> and uh, immediately texted Russell a, a series of furious texts about, can we get two vibraphones tuned two hertz apart? Um, so it, it kind of like the opening piano thing. It was just something that I just wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and both of those things ended up being a little different than I thought they would be. Um, and actually, one of the things just watching that clip just now that I had kind of forgotten about, honestly, um, I have this uh, solo piece um, called Gather and Release. And in the second half of the piece, there's this alternating clicking of a clave sample. And it's it's from alternating from left to right. And it's literally the same clave note for every single strike in both speakers. But for some reason, every time I hear that piece, the left speaker sounds a little bit different from the right speaker. Mm-hmm. Like I was talking to this about somebody and they, they couldn't believe that it was the same sample. And mm-hmm. just now watching that clip, one of the pianos sounds clearly higher to me, even though they're playing the exact same pitch. And, and I don't know what that is, but that's the kind of thing that um, really like interests me is, is the kind of weirdness of acoustic sound. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can say as somebody who's played in rock bands for decades, right, that I, I have some high end hearing loss in my left ear. So I, I think I think that when when faced with that kind of symmetry, um, you know, one one is bound to experience the two, the two source sounds differently. Right. Mm-hmm. But that's a great example of like me thinking of something and then wanting to do it to see what it's like, because that this like fake pitch difference i i never anticipated and this happens a lot where i write a piece not really knowing exactly why i'm doing it and then i hear it later and find out all about all about this find out about all of this stuff that i hadn't anticipated which is you know why i'm working with acoustic instruments at all at least one of the many reasons it was pretty funny trying to source those those instruments (laughs) um i mean that's that's some email chain you know 
it's pretty boring, but it's also interesting. Like I had, you know, all these emails out to all the rental companies in New York, all the people I knew. And we found, you know, we found one. Um, people were like, yeah, I think it, it was Nicole Patrick. She lives here in, in the city. They're like, I think Nicole has one. And I was like, <laughs> okay, here we go. You know, and we found it. I had to go to her place in like Astoria and pick, pick up the instrument. And there it was. It says 440 right under there. So, oh, but you thanks know. for indulging me. Oh no, it's great. At least you weren't looking for you know one of the old Renaissance uh, <laughs> vibraphones that are tuned. No, right. <laughs> I was going to say, given that there that there are two pianos in Yarn Wired, have you are are there other pieces in your repertoire that call for a retuning of one of the pianos? Yep. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's like a really big piece that uh, Alex Menchak wrote for us, um, uh -huh. where one of the pianos is a quarter tone flat. Sharp. What did they do? Sharp. Sharp. Yeah. No, they wouldn't want to make it flat. That'd be terrible. <laughs> the piano. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it is. It is a thing. And uh, I don't know though. Other other pieces. I'm I'm sure they exist. I just couldn't recall them right off the top of my head. Uh-huh. And uh, Laura or Ning, can you say something about, you know, where your head was in the first six or seven minutes of this piece? And like, what what concerns are paramount for you as a performer? <laughs> the truck, the reaction time that I, I I'm really have to just like meld my brain to Ning's fingers. Like I'm really just watching her for the whole first six minutes of the piece until there's like a regular rhythmic pattern because there are all these sort of breaths, these moments where time stops. And so I don't always know exactly when she's going to start again. Uh, so really my, my inside my head, I, I, I watch that uh, clip that we just saw. I look like I'm sort of like terrified. Like there's like this, I feel like I can <laughs> see myself jumping every time Ning plays um, because I was terrified a little bit. It's, it's so exposed and it's such an incredible effect. And I'm, you know, really want to execute it. I think it works best when it's executed correctly. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I was really, I was like at attention sort of the beginning of this I'm, piece. I'm laughing because it's written to like guarantee that you won't succeed. I know. <laughs> that, um, particularly, the, and I mean, Russell asked me about the length of fermatos when you were recording and I was kind of like, oh, just do whatever because <laughs> the, they're there so that, that you won't be able to predict when the next note's coming because, yeah. you know, somebody has to be in charge necessarily. And this was some, I wrote a piece in grad school that um, for two violins that I, you know, it was okay. It's not something that I would be excited about anybody hearing now, but um, one of the, one of the movements of the piece, the two violins have to stand with their backs to each other. And one of the, one of the players has sheet music. That's a series of quarter notes and fermatas and the tempo keeps changing. And then the other player is instructed to try to play in unison with that person. Ooh, and uh -huh. so I, I really, really like that sound a lot. And so I think that was in my mind when I came up with this opening too, that it was just something from a long time ago that I wanted to reuse in a, in a better way. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to comment that if you look at the score, it looks like Laura and I, it's practically playing the same thing over and over again. However, I consider that two of us have very clear divisions of responsibilities, you know, so I, I sort of, I, my mind is one zone and it's that one zone only. It's like I keep, I'm, I'm tracking the times and I am tracking where I am and I'm tracking the sort of the progress through that, um, that it, you know, one cell. And Laura's like, her mind is totally somewhere else, even though we're, we're supposed to have pretty similar, just blurred um, reactions of each other's music and, you know, almost identical. So, you know, to that aspect, I think um, physically we have very different reactions to the music. Yeah, definitely. Great. Let, let's uh, let's look at the second excerpt. Um, and so the the total work is thirty two minutes. The second excerpt uh, starts at eighteen minutes. Mm -hmm.
I, I probably should have said this at the outset, but if there's one thing that I've learned about teaching, it's that sometimes too short excerpts can, you know, can be counterproductive or, you know, can tell you almost nothing about the work. So I, you know, my exhortation to anyone watching this is to, is to look at the complete video, because I think that really it's, it's difficult to understand what's going on without that. That said, um, I want to ask Sarah about one of the things that I enjoy most about your music. Um, and I picked this excerpt because uh, this really resonated with me both in the in the during the live concert and returning to it right i remember this shift to the this beautiful vibraphone part that started about 30 seconds into what we just saw so my question is uh i would love to hear you talk about the function of sudden shifts uh within works that otherwise seem oriented around uh durations and very very slow shifts um well I think a lot about the way I, the way I write music and conceive of things is this idea of of reflecting quote unquote real life, and I think I'm I'm somewhat obsessed with this this um, activity of like something just trucking along, happening, doing its thing, and then all of a sudden it just changes for no reason. Yeah. Um, as being, you know, that's happened to all of us that like your life is just going on and then all of a sudden it's different for, you know, for better or for worse, maybe in a small way, maybe in a big way, but um, I'm particularly interested in the way that that happens without warning. And so I really like managing people's expectations in this way where, you know, you have one part at the beginning and you start to think, well, how long is this going to go on? And then, it, you know, the more that happens, the, the more, possibility the the more you you don't know what could happen to you in in the process of a, of a piece mm -hmm. um which i find is um akin to my my life experience <laughs> but i just i just really like the these um not necessarily abrupt shifts to like totally different material all the time but um it's just something that comes up again and again because i think it's just something that i am kind of obsessed with uh for musical and non-musical reasons Mm -hmm. Can you say something a little about why, like, so this fluoresces into this real beauty, right, at this moment, but, um, and maybe you've already answered this in talking about suddenness, and, you know, and the, and the fact that these things aren't, can't be foreseen, but I'm just kind of curious, and maybe it's a way also of talking about duration and scale and, you know, relation of parts within the whole of the piece, but why does this fluorescence occur when it does? And and what does it have and does it have anything to do with the scale or or you know, like is it the element of surprise that you were referring to? It I actually in the dress rehearsal I heard that and like cringe just a little because <laughs> I was like this might be too like tonal and pretty and like a little bit too reminiscent of like music that I'm not specifically not trying to imitate but um the specifically i was worried that it was like too tonal too major chordy or whatever yeah. but then i listened to it more and i realized that y you know you, you can't get this off of a youtube video but that there were these crazy either psychoacoustic or acoustic things happening in the room that were really incredible that um I tend to, especially with vibraphone stuff, I often, I mean, I've used tons of dissonant playing too, but I found that if something weird acoustically is happening, that can be explained away by dissonance because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm just hearing that because of the beating of the notes or whatever. But if you're using like, you know, I have a solo piece where I play just a straight F major chord, but what you hear is like completely wild. Um, so it's it's kind of like that, but that also that clip of 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 the piece is a little bit um i don't know if climax is the right word but it's like a moment of um of like uh it's like a focal point in the piece it's kind of like the golden section or something where things almost coalesce mm -hmm. um so i i don't again i'm like i don't have all the answers for this thing because it was just written so intuitively that um it, you know i feel like if i think of something even if i don't know why i thought of it there must be a reason that I thought of it. And so I've just started putting putting things like this into pieces because 
it's in here, so it must be in there for some reason. For you know, something happened to me that put that there, and so by putting it into a piece of music, you can see it from the outside and you, you know, learn things. <laughs> but I don't know if that answers your question exactly. But um, it absolutely does. I mean, because I was sort of asking, like, you know, in terms of measurements and and placement and you know, more conventional compositional. Um, concerns and and you yeah I mean I feel like you addressed directly okay <laughs> you know like how how and why you were able to and you allowed yourself to to include that and I actually when I wrote that little flourish I didn't know what it was going to sound like which is why I mean I had some idea of what it was going to sound like but um, I mean I'm really familiar with the vibraphone but nothing that I play on the vibraphone resembles that little section really uh -huh. at all right. um, so it, it was kind of a, a risk takey sort of thing that I ultimately decided was, you know, fine. Um, or not not fine, but like that it that it worked the way that I wanted it to. And let me ask just for for the folks in Yarnwire, you know, because you know, I sort of asked for like a status report of like what were your concerns, where was your head <laughs> at uh in in the early stages of the piece? Where where are you uh at this I mean, it's not the midpoint of the piece, but, um, but you know, Sarah, you described it as the golden section of the piece. You know, like, it's, it seems significant, emotionally significant, structurally significant, right. sonically significant. It feels well, ecstatic I, at oh, the I'm moment, sorry. right? Oh, no, go for it. Well, I, um, I, well, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but I... Stru structurally and conceptually, the the main idea of this piece is this like impossibility of togetherness, which is also something that is is in like tons of pieces of mine. Mm -hmm. And so, it the, the 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 like simplest possible conception of this is that the pianists are separated by time, and the vibraphonists are separated by pitch, and the pianos and vibraphones are separated by not being the same thing. So there's this like right at the end of that clip you saw there's this like almost coming together and then it just kind of goes its own way again mm -hmm. yeah i mean at this moment this is what page how many pages are page five um and it's like yeah this moment like we've been working really hard and then like it gets real i mean when i hear it I mean, the music is so long, it's so process oriented that you're able to listen also while playing. And um, I feel like I, I feel that moment happen also. I don't know if that's that makes sense, but it's like, you know, um, you reach it physically in terms of endurance, but also, you know, it makes sense as a as a performer. I don't know. How do you guys feel? On yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually when that moment happens and like, especially I think in that space where we played the premiere I remember that moment happening because it was like the vibraphone was inside my brain like <laughs> I could feel the sound like physically and it was amazing but also a little scary because you know Ning and I still are we're supposed to have these interlocking parts and and it just coalesced into this like wall of sound which is Personally, I love that feeling of, as a listener, of being a little overwhelmed by just sound sometimes. Um, yeah. And I love that. This part of the piece actually is, is my favorite part of the piece in a lot of ways. That, that section, that part uh, right after the like wall of sound where, where everyone's playing the same pitch, I remember laughing when I heard that because it was <laughs> like, you know, I just, you just have these moments where like something that you did is just exactly the thing that you like want to hear in the world and uh I just, i'm like i'm smiling about it now but it's just i remember i i played in chicago once and uh my friend joseph from the group coppice said that during one part of the one part of the performance he went <laughs> because of something that happened like acoustically <laughs> this kind that. of like combination of of like joy and confusion <laughs> yeah exactly that's a perfect yeah. way of putting it that that moment though there's a right after is like the one hard vibraphone lick so even <laughs> even though i get to you know kind of listen i'm like all right remember the lick <laughs> it, it's to, to me that moment it's like the moment that, that i'm um 
I'm looking forward to because I know I get a, a, a tiny bit of a rest, <laughs> <laughs> both mentally and physically. Because um, you know, Laura and I um, uh, start was it 11 minute or yeah, nine like minute, 10 minute, 11 minute. I can't remember, but right between 11 and ninth and the 11th when we start doing this consistent hocketing back and forth. Hocketing, you know, you're just doing the same thing back and forth. You know, it sounds really easy, but for many minutes at a time, it's just, it's really draining. And after a while, you know, like it accumulates between one note to both hands playing 10 notes. Um, yeah, so it, it, you know, the mind is like doing a trick too. It's like, oh, am I the offbeat? On, am I the downbeat? <laughs> yeah, it's a real philosophical quandary sometimes. <laughs> Listen to the third excerpt from the piece. So this excerpt is from 26 minutes and 30 seconds into the piece. <laughs> So I selected that section because of the extremely subtle uh, effects of the piano part, um, and I, I, I feel like Sarah, in talking about the the clave and gather and release, that that we're talking about this a little bit, like it, extremely um, subtle effects of symmetry. What's happening in the piano part? We can show the score is that essentially the same two chords are being uh, traded back and forth by the, the pianos, right? And and if you're listening on your laptop computer like I am right now, it sort of sounds like the same chord each time, right? But um, in the space of performance, the, there is a subtle spatial effect um, in and, you know, the subtle differences in timbre between the two pianos and the two pianists. Um, and so I wanted to ask you to reflect on um, uh, two different things with, with regard to this. One, composing with the, the almost infinitely subtle. Um, and then secondly, uh, uh, about the, the, the 
deployment of sounds in space and decisions about the placement of instruments, the location of the audience and so forth? Um, well, as far as like minute detail, um, I, I played this solo piece in college by Antoine Boiger, one of the Vondelweiser composers. And it was just a long, long, long series of playing the exact same sound at slow tempos. And he had these hyper precise dynamic markings, you know, like pianissimo minus three or something like that uh, throughout the whole piece. And af after I talked to him about this piece and he was like, oh, you can just ignore those dynamic markings because I realized that what I wanted to happen happens on its own. And I, I think about that all the time that, um, it, you know, this idea that, that I mentioned earlier about like the impossible impossibility of togetherness that like, in fact, that even if you are playing the exact same thing, those two things are still different. That I remember what, also when I was in college, I read something Stuart Saunders Smith wrote where he was like, uh, a plus A cannot equal A because by definition, the first A is different from the second A. <laughs> um, and I, I think about time in this way too, that like listening to something for one minute uh, experientially is really different from listening to something after six minutes and that actually doing quote unquote one thing unfolds over time. Um, and that, this minute detail is just something that is is happening on its own and so the the more simple music you write the more you amplify the fact that um these subtle details are happening and and i i like doing that a lot you know if if that clip that you just saw of the piano parts were if the pianists were playing like rhythmic patterns instead of quarter notes the thing that i'm interested in would be harder to notice Um, as far as like sound in space, um, it's, I don't know. I, it's just, uh, I can't not, I mean, everything I do, I imagine in a space and I imagine that the space is like a, a you know, another player basically that, um, that any room you're in is going to change the way that you hear and the way that the piece sounds. And so I try to account for that as much as I can. Um, it's just something that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. and, if, that, if I, can, and I mean, this is part of why I don't like using <clears throat> electronics very much is because the, um, you know, like you were saying at the beginning, this seeming, seeming relation to electronic music that like, you know, with electronic music, you can hypothetically create any possible sound, um, but seemingly you can't do that with acoustic sound, but then you find out that acoustic sound is just as complicated, if not more complicated, um, and and harder to explain, and more sort of a little cheesy to say, but more magical. You know, with with regard to space, I remember getting into the gallery, and uh, there was a pole right in the middle, yeah. <laughs> which you see prominently in the video. Video. Yeah. I, I Looking at that clip, I can see like my slouch, you know, behind <laughs> Yeah, it was a amazing venue. You know, I'm really grateful to them for, for hosting it. Um, but that was a physical constraint, you know. And um, uh, I think for that, for that premiere, we had to set it up that way. Um, and it wasn't bad. It was kind of cool because you saw the duality of the two instruments, right? Um, but we recently... Uh, recorded this piece and did a video production of it um, thanks to the Time Spans Festival and we were confronted with okay we're in this wide open space of roulette now um, what are we going to do and after rehearsing it it became really clear this bouncing back the piano thing right that I couldn't experience before and so here's an image of that um, we actually set it up totally different this is a, a different vantage point but um, the pianist they're actually kind of wedged a little bit farther apart. And so we're, I think, going to be able to get that stereo image in the recording now of, of things bouncing back and forth if we want it. Cool. And, and then the vibraphones are kind of like facing them. So more in a chamber setup than we normally would, you know, or more of a chamber setup than we were able to at the premiere where Ian and I were facing each other. Um, so we'll see 
you know, what, what that kind of thing turns out to be. But, um, I mean, as a performer, I feel like the small space of the gallery helped with the resonance of this piece a lot, um, and helped all that, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm really excited to try and play it in a more chamber configuration also to see, you know, if, um, the visual element will kind of help support it for, for audience members too. And I, I, not to like take the conversation in a totally different direction, but it was really also interesting to revisit this piece after actually not playing for a long time uh, at all <laughs> as an individual. Um, and how just, uh, I was really worried actually about the, the physical endurance things that Ning was mentioning and, and like, you know, these sort of, as Sarah said, the things that are sort of set up to make it uh, to make failure happen or to make it challenging. And I felt really differently once we started to play and rehearse again. And it's interesting that how sometimes just like time where something is like in the back of your mind percolating without you aware of it, you know, how, how things change and how your experience changes. So I'm really excited to hear this new version. Sarah, can I ask about the title of the piece? I mean, the, the, it seems so simple and, you know, unadorned, and yet it's full of all kinds of ambiguity about... Yeah, there's two two levels of truthfulness to, to my answer to this question. <laughs> One is that I really like titles that are, like you said, kind of ambiguous and might point to more than one thing. But the the truth is... I, I wrote the first half of this piece, I don't remember what month, but I wrote it and I sent it to Russell and I was like, here's the first half of this piece. You're not going to get anything else from me for like three months because <laughs> yeah, I, I was leaving leaving for gigs and I find it really hard to write when I'm traveling um, that I just can't like do those things at the same time. And the, the last half of this piece was just written like furiously fast. And I had this primers as a working title for, for months not really knowing what it meant in relation to the piece. And then finally, I just was like, you know what? It's called primers. <laughs> but I, I think I was thinking about it in a way of like, you know, like training or something that the musicians are, are trying to make this thing happen that's not quite happening. Um, so it's like, you, you know, they're um, being primed to, to, to do uh, something else. Didn't you finish it on a plane? I don't know. I feel like I, I got like, you're like, I landed, here it is, something like that. I, <laughs> I, was, I was an absolute maniac the, the year that I wrote this piece. I was, I mean, the story I tell everyone is that in February 2018, in the span of four days, I was in Tucson, New York City in Stockholm. And I just, you, you know, it's great that to, to um, have so many opportunities, but I, I really like I remember I came home from LA in January and I just like had a complete breakdown because I had been going so hard for so long. And then I kept going until late May. And actually the, the concert for primers was the I'm not leaving home for one <laughs> second more than I have to. So the, the whole thing was, was kind of a whirlwind, but um, I think a long time ago, I wouldn't have trusted myself to write so intuitively and so freely, but I think I've written enough music now that it's actually really interesting to me to write without actually knowing, having a really clear reason for why I'm doing something. The The piece for Beethoven was written really the same way that I just was like, well, let's see what happens if I do this. And work, both worked out really well, I think, and gave me pieces that were really different from the kinds of things that I had been doing. But short answer, I, I don't know. The, I, I don't know what the title means. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> but this is actually not to parallel the, the Beethoven thing, the spectral mousconsities again, but I've, I've been surprised that nobody has asked me what mousconsity means because it, I had a dream that I had named a piece spectral mousconsities. And of course I Googled it when I woke up and I was like, this is not a word. This is not a real <laughs> word. <laughs> and so I just, I didn't know what to call that piece. And the piece is thematically really similar. And I just was like, well, I dreamed this, so it must mean something. So I'm going to use it, even though I don't know why. Um, but it's totally, totally made up. 
I love that. That's awesome. That's why you didn't know how to pronounce it, Russell. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, but we I pronounce it the same way. That's will, great. <laughs> I keep hoping somebody will ask me. Uh, uh, for some, I my theory is that everyone is afraid to admit that they don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're right about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh man. Fine. Well, I think that we have a question oh, yeah. uh, from the audience, if that's okay, if we can kind of pause and take that. Um, and this question is from Jenny, who asks, do any of you, including David, find yourselves thinking about the form or trajectory of the piece in extra musical ways? Hmm. I feel like I think about form and trajectory of what I'm doing, like almost entirely in extra musical ways of like, you know, trying to reflect back things that that concern me. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm obviously interested in musical ideas, but al almost always there's some underlying extra musical thing that is driving the trajectory of every piece. I don't know if that's that's probably unique, not unique to me, but um, maybe more so than others. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say for me, it's it's a it's a big difference hearing or encountering Sarah's work in live performance and in recorded form and recorded form, <clears throat> obviously aware of like the time I can see you see the time at the top right of my computer. Uh, you know, like it, it, it feels like a much more rationalized composed. Like I think I, my mind tends to, to think about the structure or the organization of the composition and it, it can be lulling. It can be exhausting. It can be, you know, like tiresome, like, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like the one's body, you know, and one's ability su to sustain attention um, is very, di is very different in, in the live setting. And, and uh, as much as I'm delighted to have recordings of these works that I can return to, I, I kind of feel like my most meaningful experiences of your work, Sarah, has been in live performance where there's no clock, you know, like I'm not, you know, I don't have access to the score, you know, that I'm really like at sea with the work because I think that that's really, um, I don't know, kind of like consonant with, with, with the work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, for me, like every, I've, I mean, this is why COVID has been, well, I mean, obviously COVID is difficult for many reasons that are more important than the one I'm about to say, but the loss of live performance has been really difficult for me because how I work and how I hear and like how I like to interact with people is just gone right now. And it's, it's really r rough, but um, you know, everybody's in the same situation, but the way that like the way that sound works in space for me is just like, critically important to everything because it just is more r real hmm. yeah i don't think i would i could really add much to any extra musical experience because i feel like as we're performing <laughs> like i do have the timer for this piece you know and so i you know <clears throat> i think of where we're going and where we are in the piece because already we know the form you know and so part of it is like i mean in a way i guess it's like uh, if you run a race or something like that and this piece is a little bit like that you know in terms of uh mental uh, endurance and physical at times uh, you have to be able to pace yourself and so i think you know that's one thing that i'm thinking but it's it's really kind of physical um, and mental yeah, I think my my thoughts about this piece again, it's like I mean, we've I think we've said this in a lot of episodes how it, things are so different for us performing a piece than when we get to go back and listen to it. Um so in that way the recording is so valuable for us cuz it helps us step outside of ourselves in a way that we're not able to in live performance. Uh and I that's when I start to find the extra musical or the sort of you know, I don't know and it's not anything concrete it's more of just like a feeling or these sort of like waves or types of energy that I feel differently um when I'm listening to the piece being performed rather than being inside of it for sure 
Nice. Well, um, if anyone has anything else, happy to chat about it. But um, I think we're running up on on time for today. So um, I want to thank you both, Sarah and David, for for being here and taking the time to to hang out and and chat with us uh, about primers. There's so I always feel like around this time we could probably go on for another hour, two hours, um, but uh, maybe we should revisit it at some point in the future. Um, but it's been great catching up and and talking about the piece. Uh, I want to let everyone know that our next episode is on Tuesday, November seventeenth. Uh, we're going to be talking with Olivia Block and uh, with art historian Magda Moskalewicz. Um, so remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. Uh, make sure to check out all of Sarah's releases and David's books and music as well. Um, I think those will be in the chat. Um, to support this project, uh, please visit our page on patreon.com and you can receive lots of bonuses and you know extra tracks and everything as our thanks for your support. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on Tuesday.